Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, it's episode 229. If you like Cosmic Encounter, try these other games. We'd like to thank our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. Anthony, we are back after a wondrous and totally impressive victory at the World Cup. And man, I got to tell you, I know that we're a board game podcast, but every once in a while we throw some sports in there just to kind of even things out. You know, we got our nerd cred, but, you know, a little jock cred for here and there doesn't hurt. What do you think of the uh, final match? Yeah, I mean, I actually, for I got the time wrong, so I didn't watch it. But my wife oh, said, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had like scheduled a board game with with some friends. So I, I didn't get a chance to watch per se, but I was well aware of it. And I'd watched like the, the two matches before that. So I was in. I was like, I wanted to know what was going on. Yes, the women's team defeated Denmark to zip. It was a fantastic game, and really everybody involved did an amazing job. Danish goalkeeper, she was incredible. The U.S. was shooting on goal the whole game long, and I believe she she won an award just for her goalkeeping alone, and she was well-deserved. So the U.S. had the, probably the hardest road considering the great talent of the other countries. So for them to come away with the victory was a big day, and it was a fantastic victory. Uh, even if you're not into soccer or the women's team of the U.S. It was just really a great competition to see and some fantastic players there. So uh, if you haven't got a chance yet, check out, uh, you know, that final match or just go on YouTube and check out some clips because I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, Anthony. So let's talk about some other fantastic competitions that we are having on BGA. Let's talk about our Patreon contest. Yeah, yeah. So you guys might have noticed I didn't post anything last week. It was the 4th of July here in the US. So not a lot of activity, not a lot of traffic anywhere. So we're gonna we're gonna make up for it here in July. But I was away, everybody else is away and <laughs> didn't get the contest up. But if you have if not had a chance to participate yet, keep your eyes open because this Thursday, uh, same day that the episode goes up, Right around the middle of the day, uh, depending on when I get the photos up, we'll have the contest go out. We've mostly done these photo contests th thus far. They're pretty fun. I'm still trying to brainstorm some other cool stuff as well. So don't don't expect that they'll all be photo contests, but those are a lot of fun with the components. So keep your eyes out. We'll post them up. Probably moving forward, I'm going to put a form up so you can submit it like directly in there with a timestamp and everything. Um, so there's no confusion over who got in first. And uh, yeah. Check that out. It'll be up all weekend. All right. So if you'd like to jump in, patreon.com slash BGA. Your support helps us a great deal, and we love having you out there. If you can't contribute to Patreon, please let everyone know about the podcast, especially when you go out there and purchase games online or at your local friendly game store. It makes a huge difference. We get a lot of emails from you about taking our recommendations and actually turning them into purchases. And we just like to let other people know about that because we really want people to make the best choices in gaming. So, Anthony, uh, you know, speaking about some of the best choices in gaming, you and I recently made a choice with Kickstarter. Uh, I don't know if it was the best choice in gaming, so to speak, but <laughs> you and I backed the new Lorenzo expansion on Kickstarter not so long ago, and we talked about their... I don't know if you would call it a video game release or an electronic release or just a Steam release, but they they re release an electronic version of Lorenzo El Magnifico, and you can listen to our conversation <laughs> about that last week. Anthony, uh, in a nutshell, what did you think of that game? Uh, you know, you all heard it last week. It was bad. It's a, <laughs> it's a bad implementation. Now, to be fair, I've had a couple of people tell me like, oh, I never played the board game and I like the mechanics. Now I'm going to go check out the board game. Awesome. I'm glad you want to play the board game. But man, if you've ever played the board game, you know that this app does need to exist in this current form. I hope it gets better, but this is what I paid for. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that was Anthony's glowing recommendation for it. And I, I didn't enjoy it as well. I think most of the time the challenge here is when they're trying to produce this electronic version, they want to do something different. They want to provide a different type of experience. So it's not just the board game, but electronic format. But in fact, I would say nine times out of 10 with, you know, there are exceptions. You really just want to play the game. 
So today, I and probably many of you received the rest of the Kickstarter package, which was the real reason why I backed it. And I, Anthony, you backed it too because of this, right? The cards? Yes, 100%. I would have waited on the app. <laughs> yeah, the app was not even a thing for me. So yes, I, I backed it. And today I came home and there was a small package and it said cards on it. And I was really excited. I didn't remember what I backed. I don't know if that's ever <laughs> happened to you. You know, I was like, I backed a Kickstarter? What was this, 12 years ago or something? And it was a small package. And I was like, oh, what could this be? And I opened it up. And it was this little eatsy beatsy tiny, tiny, tiny pack of cards for Lorenzo. The cards that we've been waiting for for a while now. <laughs> and I, would, I just looked at it. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> What is this? All of this, all that, that, you know, the electronic version and the backing and the waiting and the traveling and across the globe to get a little tiny pack of tiny, tiny, tiny cards that doesn't have any rules or explanation to what they do or how they do it because it implements a couple of new mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Anthony, you want to, you want to talk me down from this? Maybe. I mean, or do you it's, want to join me on it, the ledge? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not. I, I mean, I haven't played with the new cards yet, so I don't know. And I do agree. I didn't actually realize until you mentioned it that it does not actually come with any rules or explanation of anything. I'm sure that's all online somewhere, but I don't want to have to go find it. Um, but that said, the one thing I always wanted for Lorenzo was more variety and what cards were available. So I'm, I'm fine with this. Uh, we'll see. I don't know how much it needed it after you got the expansion that kind of added added the fifth tower, but... I'm still okay with it, and I'm. That's the reason I backed it. It's more or less what I expected. It's kind of a, a bare bones nothing of a presentation. The way they sent it out, so no box, no anything. But uh, and until I play with them, I will. I'll reserve judgment at least on the cards. I, I just wanted to see something as as you mentioned, as far as presentation is concerned, or just explanation as far as rules are concerned. The challenge of getting more cards to add to a system that already has a lot of cards especially with the expansion now it absolutely needed more cards it just did so that's great but you know what like you said the expansion came out and kind of filled this role so these extra cards do things which as you mentioned you and i have not play tested yet so maybe they do great things but i'm wondering and a little bit worried that this just might get diluted it might not really have much of an effect but i guess you and i will take a look at this and let people know if all of that weight, want, desire, and expense was worth any little tiny deck of cards. I guess that's for a uh, at the table at a later date. But speaking of those things, listeners talking about Anthony, what's our question of the day? All right, question of the week this week. I asked everybody, what's your favorite gaming experience? Not necessarily a favorite game, but best mechanic, event, group dynamic, whatever that might be. So what do you enjoy most about the hobby in the moment? Got a lot of really good answers here. Some of them are specific games. Some of them are specific events. Some of them are a specific moment at a specific event. So I'll run through a few of these. Uh, I, I thought they were all pretty good. David Bryson, he says, I love this question. I recently asked this to members of my gaming group. So many happy gaming memories. If I had to choose just one, it would be the first completion of the Scythe Rise of Fenris campaign. After playing Scythe since it first came out, to see the story fleshed out with a more complimentary elements and with an appreciative group was magical i loved every moment eric who says when i introduce a new game and the whole group whether it's friends or family love the game and want to keep playing it uh, normally party games like monikers or wits and wagers pull this off also interactive games like bonanza scott mentions teaching a game and then seeing that click moment when it all kind of comes together for the person who's learning the game i also really like this moment because so often when you're teaching a game, some people maybe don't have that moment or they have the opposite of that moment where they're just like, I hate this, you know, <laughs> and you're just miserable because you want them to love this game that you've brought. It's just like you're on pins and needles the whole time waiting for them to get excited like you are. So it's really cool when that actually happens. Michael mentions ConCon uh, up in Stanford. It's his favorite convention. He describes it as not super huge, tons of games, lots of heavy games, good solid schedule. So I think a lot of people mention conventions that they really enjoy going to as part of this. Like if there's that one convention, our buddy Dave, of course, mentions the World Board Gaming Championships, specifically his competition in 2014 and 2015 in the El Grande tournament, which makes perfect sense if you know Dave. 
And yeah, I mean, I think there's so many different ways to enjoy this hobby. Like I last night was playing Lisboa with some friends here in Pittsburgh and uh, they almost got into a fight. <laughs> <laughs> like a good natured fight, but somebody decided to place a public building in a location that hurt somebody else more than it helped them. And well, things went down. So <laughs> we had a good 15, 20 minute pause in the, in the action so people could cool off. That's the kind of stuff. It's fun. You remember those things, you know, obviously nobody was really that mad, but it's just like, it's a fun experience. People get really into it mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you'll, you'll take that away with you. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of little things for me. I mean, obviously, we've talked about a number of these in the podcast. I think convention-wise, the packs unplugged these last two years have been fantastic. Last year in particular, because it was closer to Christmas time and Philadelphia had a number of different events going on. So it was really nice and special to kind of not just enjoy the convention and see people enjoying games and bouncing from game to game, but also walking you know, Philadelphia, which is a fantastic city. The weather was great. It had just a touch of winter to it. And I really enjoyed that convention. I guess on the board gaming front, you know, I really enjoy teaching a game. And then when people get it and love it, that's a big moment for me. And on, you know, the actual playing side of it, you know, I've had moments where I've played Agricola. And I remember this one moment where I was able to feed my people at the end of the round and I was so happy. And I was just like, I didn't think I was going to be able to feed everybody. And I somehow worked it out because when you play these Euro games, a lot of your strategy goes into play like in the first hour. And then you see in the second hour or the third hour, in some cases, if it actually pays off. So it's always really, uh, you know, self-satisfying to see the fact that those things did bear fruit even if you don't win the game, it's still pretty enjoyable to go, oh, that did work. That was not a mistake an hour and a half ago. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of fantastic little moments here and there. Uh, it's just been a, a really great hobby. Excellent people uh, going down to the big conventions, Origins and Gen Con and just meeting designers and meeting listeners out there. It's just been a fantastic hobby and everyone involved and especially all the listeners out there. Thank you so much for making this uh, a great and powerful joy in my life. All right, so that's everything for our question of the week. If you'd like to join us and we would love to hear about your great moments in gaming, please join us on Twitter, Facebook, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek. And obviously we have a, so many different ways to reach out to us, to listen to us, and to even watch us on YouTube. So check us out, like us, follow us, share us, do everything you possibly can to get board gaming out there. All right, Anthony, so that's everything from our listeners. Let's get on to the games that we want to hit the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. Okay, yeah, so I have one here this week that I don't actually know if I'm going to like this or not, but I want to, so I'm going to throw it in here and hope that it's good. <laughs> you know, you know, you ever see a game that pops up and you're just like, man, that sounds like it could be cool, and then sure. you read the actual description and you're like, ugh, what are you doing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, all, all the games. <laughs> yeah, so often, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is this is City Skylines, the board game. Uh -huh. I think we mentioned this like in passing a couple of weeks ago, but it is based on the video game, which is essentially like the modern equivalent of SimCity. City Skylines is the city building game if you want a city building game. So love it. I've spent dozens of hours in it. I love these games. They're making a board game of it. It's coming from Cosmos for some reason. Usually they make like family stuff. It is a cooperative tile laying game. Okay. Uh, <laughs> designed by the designer of Nations, mm -hmm. who, which initially I'm like, oh, cool. You know, he's, that's, I love that game. And then I looked at his most recent games, which was Tribes, Dawn of Humanity, which is not very good. Hex Roller, also not very good. <laughs> and then the, the new Warhammer Age of Sigmar game, which I haven't played, so I don't know. But I don't know what to make of this game. You have all these different polyomino pieces and this the result is this very flat board where you're placing things out and trying to i guess reach a certain number of number of milestones mm -hmm. and make the people in the city happy which is usually what you do in a city building game you're trying to get, make everybody happy so you'll deal with things that come up on cards like hey the garbage collection's an issue the crime is an issue we want more parks you know again the things you're used to in those games is represented by the cards i just i don't know how it's going to play out like i I don't know why it's cooperative. I don't know. <laughs> it just, there's a lot of question marks here. Like I'm hoping they have a demo of this at an upcoming convention so I can give it a try. 
it also looks like it's relatively inexpensive. Like the pre-orders are up for like 35 bucks. So it's probably like a 40 or $50 game. So there's probably not much in the box either. I don't know. I really want like a big sweeping city builder that just does a lot of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. This doesn't look like it, but I guess we'll see. Uh, It's on my list because there are polyominoes, but it's not really what I would want from this. Yeah, this is kind of, (laughs) I guess we talked about Lorenzo having this kind of lackluster steam performance, but a very good board game. And here we look at Skylines, which you can actually pick up relatively cheap right now on steam they're running all their different sales uh currently it's at seven dollars and 49 cents which sounds like a lot coming from a board game (laughs) situation but actually it's a fairly inexpensive video game here so I, i think that if it has any qualities that we've seen out of the video game i think it'll be okay but as you mentioned you know when you play a sim city kind of game there's so many of those little notifications and and little, you know, treats that come along with building the city, having the individual trees, having the things move through the city, almost like having a model train set that, as you mentioned, sounds like a good idea to have this Polyamo building cities, but it doesn't seem like it has really much of anything to it. So at least at the moment, this is kind of a pass for me, but I, I will definitely hopefully get a chance to play this. Yeah, I'm definitely going to play it. But yeah, you tell me it's an hour long and it's cooperative uh, and it's 40 bucks and it's from Cosmos. Uh, and I'm like, seems like it's designed for Target. And I don't know about that. So <laughs> See, that's going to bug me too, because the alpha gamer problem when you have to place down polyominoes, that's going to be driving me crazy. Oh, no. Oh, oh, put it there. Oh, no. What if you put that one? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess we'll see how that we'll see how that works. Like maybe they maybe they've thought of that. I hope they've thought of uh, that. All right. Well, another Kickstarter that also looks very good, but has a bit of an issue to it, is a game that we've talked about also previously. This is Preda Porta. This is the clothing making game that is in its third edition. It came out, a couple people got it to the table. And then it completely disappeared. I believe there was a second edition, although I don't remember remember hearing or seeing about the second edition. And now there is a third edition. This is uh, by our friend Ignacy Trevacek. And obviously him from Portal Games means that you're probably going to get a very good production of this. It's on Kickstarter right now, and it will back on Monday, July 22nd. It already has enough backers to actually be produced. And... This is a game that I've been looking forward to. I never got a chance to play it. It passed my view at one point. Someone brought it in. Somebody wanted to play it. And then it just quickly left. It never came back. And once again, you're dealing with, I hate to say this, it's probably one of these kind of like, hey, you know, creating clothing is for girls and we're boys. And that's kind of silly. But I I think that's what it comes down to. Because uh, if you ever play Rococo or try to get people to play Rococo, you get similar kind of uh, looks. So once again, it's a game about making all these fashions, utilizing machinery, getting fabrics from different places, upgrading uh, the technology, getting contracts and selling your line. Doesn't seem that really inspiring as, as far as a game mechanic is concerned, but you know what? It's very different and it's very interesting. And the artwork is really fantastic And it's nice to see a different theme to the game. They were supposed to, at least from what I heard, make this into a computer game kind of simulation or something along that line. Like they were going to reskin it some other way. I think this is fine. I'm really looking forward to this. Here's the challenge for me. Because this is a Kickstarter, once again, you're not going to get to see this at the table, so to speak, because it's just not going to get there until everybody gets it. And on top of which, it is fairly expensive of game. It's $60 and that's not including shipping. And depending where you live, if you live in the U S I think it's another $17. So you're talking about at least $77 without every other little minor thing kind of added to it. It doesn't seem at this point that there's anything Uber exclusive here. There's an early bird edition for a variable setup mini expansion, which doesn't seem to be much of anything. And they're also going to be adding some, uh, how would you say, artist 
you know, kind of collection of clothing and such from different artists. So Ryan Lockett is here throwing in some, you know, some extra cards to kind of play with. And there's also going to be a number of other unlockable artists that are going to be adding to this. It doesn't seem or doesn't sound to be a Kickstarter exclusive, at least not that I could see. Maybe in somewhere in this small, small text, it does say something on those lines. But this is a game that I'm looking forward to playing. But to be honest with you, I'm going to pass on the Kickstarter. It's just way too expensive for what it is. And at this point, I'm holding a really, really tiny, small deck of cards in my hand and feel, feeling a little burnt from, from uh, Kickstarter these days. Yeah, it's funny. Like I, I didn't realize it was up, actually, until I saw it on the spreadsheet. But like looking at all the components you get, it doesn't look like... I mean, I guess it's 60 bucks. You're getting... I don't, I don't even know what they... Like, there's a 60 and then a 90. Yeah. And all you get in that is a poster. I mean, it's full now, but it's like a poster and a signature. I'm like, what are you paying $30 for? I don't know. I don't know if there's enough here to justify that price on Kickstarter. Like, if it was retail 60, sure, that's what it sure. looks like. But uh, on Kickstarter, I don't know. I guess we'll find out how many um, expansion, like those little mini expansions come with it. Because they haven't updated their stretch goals yet from where they actually are with the funding. Yeah, Ignacy's games, at least Portal's games, typically come in a little high, and then once they hit retail, they kind of get cut pretty hard. And obviously, because he's from Poland, and I'm assuming the game's coming from Poland, uh, the shipping is free as far as that's concerned. But the continental US, 17 bucks, And yeah, everywhere else... Shipping is bad. Everywhere else is like 29 37 The rest of the world is 50 So... I mean, even if you just wait till it hits retail online and you buy it there, you're paying practically nothing from shipping in comparison. So, uh, you know, I want the game when it first comes out. I'm that guy, man. But I just can't bite at this just because it's, as you mentioned, for what you're getting component wise, it's just not there. There's a lot of hype. There's a ridiculous amount of hype for this game and I'm into it, but not at this price point. All right, so that's our acquisition to Sorters. Anthony, let's get on to the games that actually hit the table this week, and let's let everyone know if the games are a buy and they should run out and pick those games up. If those games are a play and you should sit down and play them, if those games are a dodge and you should avoid them at all costs, or if those games are a burn and you should just throw them out and never talk about them again. So, Anthony, what did you get to the table this week? All right, I got a game called Crown of Amara. Uh, this one came out at uh, Essen last year, I believe, uh, from Pegasus Spiel. I know it's going to be at Gen Con this year, but it might just be Pegasus. I'm not sure if anybody picked this up in the West, but I had local store happened to have a copy, so I picked it up and I got a chance to play it. So this is a designer who in the past had really just done children's games. Like you look at his the, the games he's done on um, BGG and it's just hobby games and Things related to hobby games. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of like his first medium weight Euro. And it is a medium weight Euro. It's like it's relatively light. It's fairly simple. It takes an hour, hour and a half to play. So it's very similar to all those games kind of coming out right now. But I thought it did some interesting things, uh, mechanically speaking. So I kind of want to run through what those were and whether or not you know it's worth playing for those people who um, like to track down that kind of game. Um, so the... The way the game is structured is you have two separate boards with rondelles on them, and you're going to have two meeples of your own. Uh, one will be on the resource rondelle, uh, which has um, wheat, wood, stone, and cloth. And the other one is on kind of the action board where you can do things with all mm -hmm. that stuff. And on your turn, you're going to have a... You start out with a deck of cards, and you're going to draw up three of them every round, and you're going to play all three of those cards in the order that you would like to play them taking turns of course and the uh the deck is going to run out um and you're going to cycle through it two times so you have a certain number of rounds in the game you're going to use every card in that deck twice um each of those cards does i don't know some of them just give you a resource some of them let you take an extra action some of them give you like a signet ring which does some other cool stuff they don't do a ton, but there are a few tactical advantages to using certain cards at certain times. Along with that, you will also be able to choose from the slots in front of you how many spaces your guy is going to move. So you put the card down in the slot. It stays there for the round, so you can't take that number of movement again. But you either move one, two, or three, and you choose which rondelle you move on. So 
you can move either meeple and then you take the action where you land and you kind of so you have to kind of try to math it out and figure out where you're going and there are other special things you can do to kind of manipulate and maneuver where you're going to go and how you're going to do it but at the end of the day you're gathering a certain amount of resources you are spending those to complete various tasks in the city you can convert them into victory points or you can pick up these other like more powerful things. You get bonus tiles and tokens that give you extra additional resources later in the game. There are coins you can pick up that also let you do things. You can trade in coins and rings to get these, um, I guess they're titles. So you kind of move up in the hierarchy, the nobility. Uh, and those are just worth victory points at the end of the game. The cool thing about the game, though, is that there's two types of points. So... You can get like just standard victory points or you can get like building victory points. And at the beginning of the game, the building victory points start at like 35 to 40 uh, based on the event card you draw. And the regular one starts at zero. But at the end of the game, your score is whichever one is the lowest. So you spend the first half of the game just trying to get your zero all the way up as far as you can. But then later on, you kind of have to go back and forth between the two. So tactically, you have to decide when you want to push one versus pushing the other. Maybe you just push your house up a whole bunch early on just because so you can take advantage of those things cheaply at the beginning of the game and then worry about the rest later. It's an interesting mechanic that I really liked. And I mean, it gives some people a little bit of a headache because they lose track of where they are, what they're scoring and who's in the lead. But it, it keeps you from just like narrowing in on one path to victory. The game does have an event deck. The events don't do a ton, but they do throw like a resource at you or like a little extra twist every round just to make sure nobody's ever completely resource poor. There's also like you can place extra workers in some of the buildings that give you bonus resources when you move around that rondelle. So there's a lot of little things thrown in here and there. But overall, I felt like it all flowed together very smoothly. Every time I've played it, it's been less than 90 minutes, sometimes as short as an hour, but still feeling like you're getting some good tactical decision making in there so it's not it doesn't feel as light as it probably is and, and that's really good for me especially because these games have a place in my bag uh, there's a lot of opportunities to play them but sometimes they just feel like a whole bunch of fluff and they're not necessarily as fun to play as a bigger one so i like it i like crown of amara quite a bit i uh i would i think the price point I don't know where it's going to be at. I feel like if they bring it to the U.S., it's going to end up being like 60 bucks or something. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's worth that. Yeah, I don't know. I, like, I don't know what the price is in, in Europe, and I don't know what they're selling it for at Gen Con. But it's definitely worth a play. If the price comes in at a good point, like 40 bucks or something, I would say even worth picking up if you're looking for a good medium weight game that has a little bit of meat to it and some kind of unique, cool ideas behind it. Yeah, there isn't a lot, at least currently, that's going to be coming out for this kind of, as you mentioned, a medium board game euro market, especially at this price point. Obviously, we just talked about a couple of games that are at a higher price point. And especially, it looks very good. I think that's something that if you're, as you're saying, it plays well, it looks good. And if hopefully it has, I would probably say no more than hopefully a $50 price tag MSRP. I, I think this might be something I want to pick up. I mean, it just looks like a really fun little game. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I just pulled up the BGG preview. So Pegasus Spiel is selling it at Gen Con for $50. Almost certainly if a US publisher picked it up, they'd add $10 to that. But at the moment, if you get it from the Germans, it's 50 bucks. Yes, definitely buy from the Germans then because uh, I don't think this is above a $50 game for me. So... Yeah, I, I think that this is something I actually will pick up. All right, so I want to talk about something the complete opposite. This is not a German game, so to speak. This is actually a game that's going to be hitting your big box stores if it hasn't gotten there already. So take a look at your target. So look for your uh, French French um, marketeers out there. This is Jaws. Now, Jaws, as many of us knows, is that famous movie way back when all the way in the 1970s and it was all about the shark that terrorized this little tiny island and was eating the swimmers and then the people from the island brody hopper and quint got together and to take out this giant shark i don't have to explain this to you if you've watched any american movies or popular culture you're probably very familiar with jaws but you probably don't know that it's now a board game based upon that exact movie which is kind of weird, to be honest with you. There's been a lot of other sequels to Jaws, but Jaws honestly hasn't been rebooted and really hasn't been around in a long time. There's a lot of other 
giant monster aquatic movies in recent days. I think The Meg was the last one. And so when I heard about Jaws coming, I was like, huh, all right. I'm not sure who this is for, but okay, let's take a look at it. So as I mentioned, this is a big box game and we're looking at not an individual designer in this case. And Robinsonberger is bringing this out. And basically, the game is a hidden movement game, which fits very well with the Jaws movie theme because the shark is hiding and eating people at the beach. And your job is to track down the shark, find out where he is, and then kind of challenge him to a one-on-one. -on -one. Now, this is a co-op game. So one, one player plays the shark and the other three players will play the other members of this team that comes together to take down Jaws. So the first part of the game is, as I mentioned, all about the hidden movement. And you're dealing with this small island, Amity, and you're trying to figure out where Jaws is. And you're trying to attach two of these buoys to Jaws so that you always know where he is. And you're able to shut down beaches before Jaws moves around, eats people, and basically ruins the summer, so to speak. Now, the second part of the game is actually where things change a bit. And what happens then at that point is the board flips over and you'll add some additional tiles to the board. And now you have this, the final scene of Jaws, where you have the ship, the orca phase, and this big boat and Brody and Hopper and Quint who all have special abilities and they'll have special cards that will help you take down Jaws while Jaws is trying to eat parts of the boat away. And basically, the battle comes down to a bunch of dice rolling, utilizing special cards. And if the humans kill the shark, they win. If the shark attacks the orca and takes it down, then the great white wins. So that's pretty much it. The game is about an hour to about an hour and 15 minutes. It can definitely take longer if people are really trying to kind of like strategize where they're going to move the shark around. And other people are trying to, you know, talk amongst themselves about where they're going to kind of drop certain things it's a very very light game it's it's not something to kind of you know rack your brain about so to speak it's about a 2.25 on the weight scale but i think it's actually a little bit lighter it's a little bit fiddly as far as the tokens are concerned but if you do like jaws if this is like your movie and you're looking for a lightweight family so to speak type of game i guess i can give this a play but i think for every other gamer out there that jaws wasn't this huge film in your life and you're looking for some really good gameplay i am going to give this game a dodge you know just like we talked about the dastardly races you know last week same thing kind of applies here this is either absolutely for you and then it's worth the play or it's everybody else and it's pretty much a dodge yeah i feel like we're seeing a lot of that lately and maybe it's just like the bigger companies trying to cash in on the the board game craze they're like let's get this niche thing let's get this niche thing but the result seems to be a lot of mediocre games which is giving me flashbacks to the 90s and we had all those horrible tie-in games yes well, I guess the only thing we could say that's really good about this is that it's not another Monopoly clone. So it's good that we have something different out there that you can kind of introduce people into different mechanics like a hidden movement situation. But there are other hidden movement games that you can play that are a lot better. But if you are a super dedicated Jaws fan, then definitely check out Jaws. All right, Anthony. So that's everything that's hitting our table. Let's get on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we are taking a look at Cosmic Encounter, that fantastic game about playing radically different alien races in a very asymmetrical power set type of way in which you are trying to claim victory over the opponent's planets. And you do so by a number of different mechanics that's made the game so popular and so famous throughout the years. There's been so many different versions of this that came out. But primarily, the game has stayed very much the same. It's wacky. It's fun. It's a take that kind of game. It's a pile on other people. <laughs> and really, it just is one of the most unpredictable games in board gaming, especially a game that's been around for so many years. And it's just maintained its presence in board gaming and yet it's so very unique and there's nothing else out there like Cosmic Encounter. What do you think, Anthony? Yeah, it's it's a funny game because I don't generally like 
most of the mechanics that go into it, but it's, this is such a just fun experience, whether it's pulling a random alien out of the deck and knowing that I probably haven't played with it before because there's hundreds of them or just seeing again, those moments where everybody wants to murder each other and you just have to pause the game and say, all right, who's doing what now? <laughs> because it gets a little out of control. It's, it's a lot of fun. There are those moments of course, where the game can just end before you get a turn or, you know, you just get completely knocked out in the first five minutes, but that's kind of the joy of it. It is chaos. It is chaos. The game. It is. And it does a really good job of doing that really in an unabashed manner. When you see the alien cards and some are definitely more powerful than the others, everyone at the table, and this is not a co-op game has to kind of manage that themselves. There's the destiny deck that actually chooses who fights who. So that kind of, you know, makes things a little bit easier, but then you choose teams and that gets really messy. And then you play cards on top of that. That gets messy. And then there is always, as Anthony mentioned, those situations in which somebody can win the game and you never even actually got a turn. And that's actually happened to me. So we're going to talk about some games that are very similar to Cosmic Encounter, especially dealing with some of the mechanics that come into play. So, Anthony, what the mechanic... So what are the mechanics that you are talking about and what games relate to it? All right. So the part of Cosmic Encounter I wanted to focus on was the take that element, if only because I usually hate it. So <laughs> I was like, all right, I like it in this. What are three other games where I like it or don't mind it as much? So I'm going to start off with the first game I played in my hobby board gaming uh, discovery phase, and that was Revolution. I actually played that with you, Chris, and Drew. Drew taught the game. And I liked it quite a bit. I mean, it was the first type of game like this I'd ever played. And I was like, man, I didn't know board games could be so mean. But this is a particularly mean game. So <laughs> you have multiple locations in the city. You are secretly bidding to gain control of them. But you don't just have like normal bids. You also have blackmail and coin that does different things purchases you know people's attention and loyalties but you also can use might which overcomes other things so it's almost like this like bluffing rock paper scissors game in which you can just completely undercut and absolutely destroy people if if you get the upper hand in these bids it is decently brutal you obviously make all these bids at the same time and how many bids you have available might change throughout the game but the bluffing and the counter bluffing and the counter counter bluffing as you try to get inside somebody's head really makes this game what it is. And uh, it tends to make people angry for the 30 to 45 minutes you play it. So yeah, I don't know if this is really in print anymore, but they made enough copies back in the day that you could probably still find it. It is a it's a very solid game. Hopefully they bring it back in a third printing. Um, that's Revolution from Steve Jackson. Number two here uh, is another one that I was surprised I liked so much. But again, it was pretty early in my board gaming days. Uh, it's nothing personal. So nothing personal is a game about a whole bunch of gangsters trying to take over for the capo who is about to retire. So you are going to do all sorts of stuff behind the scenes and you're going to try to move up this ladder, move your guy up this ladder and take control of the mafia. The game plays, I think three or three to five players, uh, if I remember correctly. And you have five different years or game rounds in which you're going to try to build up the most respect amongst other people by using things like, you know, different actions to give you influence, blackmailing people, bribery. There is ample negotiation in the game. So this is one of those games. And a lot of these games are like this, that you can negotiate with somebody. You can make a deal. You don't have to fulfill the deal. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do. I always find those games really fun. I don't personally do that very much because, you know, my social anxiety will get the best of me. And I'm like, I don't want to lie, but it's really fun to watch when other people do it to each other. <laughs> it just turns the table into chaos. It's a little bit more structured. It's a little bit more organized than like a cosmic encounter, but it definitely has some of those roots and you can feel it. If only because one of the co-designers is Tom Vassell and he is, you know, cosmic encounter is one of his favorite games. This is a very good, fun experience. Again, it, I don't know that it's necessarily in print, but also there's enough of them out there that you don't have to spend a fortune if you want to give it a go. So nothing personal is definitely worth checking out if you like that take that element. It's, it's pretty good. Last one on the list and also not in print, but will be soon <laughs> is Dune. This is, 
going back, this is like a 1970s board game. And it was actually designed by the same design team that did Cosmic Encounter. So it has a lot of the same bones to it. But again, a little bit more organized in that game. You are in control of one of the six families who are trying to wrest control over the spice trade um, on Arrakis. And that, of course, involves a lot of negotiation, a lot of careful manipulation, a lot of kind of balance of the, the political structure, not letting other people's military get too strong, but at the same time dealing with all this stuff on the outside, like there's storms, there's sandworms. The game is very much political. It's very much negotiation heavy. It's very much bluffing and a little bit of fighting and combat in there. You know, when you decide to shove the knife and go after somebody, you know, there's a lot of hidden bids as well, of course, like any game like this. And then, of course, there's, you know, some treachery cards thrown in there for good measure. The new version of this is coming out this year. Uh, it has beautiful new artwork and it has been and generally doesn't really say how much of it's been updated uh, in terms of like mechanics. The game has been re-released in other versions before. Uh, Fantasy Flight did a version called Rex that's in the Twilight Imperium universe, which is kind of perfect. Uh, this new version uses, uh, again, much d more different, much more evocative artwork. But mechanically speaking, you know, it's still credited to the three original designers coming from Gale Force 9. So I don't think there's a ton of like revisions there. It's still Dune. It's still all about, you know, controlling this planet but at the same time controlling what everybody around you does lots and lots of take that elements in there i'm pretty excited for this i haven't played like a full game of this because of like just how rare it is to find like a decent copy of it my local game store did have one uh, we kind of went through a little bit and then i have gotten a chance to sit down for parts of rex as well um just watching other people screaming at each other <laughs> over that one so i'm pretty excited to get this to the table even though this is Almost certainly not normally my type of game. That is Dune and uh, nothing personal in Revolution. So three games with some uh, heavy take that elements. Well, another great element to Cosmic Encounter beyond the take that type of element is the unique partnerships that come into play. Cosmic Encounter is not a co-op game, but the game allows you to team up with the attacker or with a defender once a Destiny card has set the battle up. So... That mechanic is really unique and interesting. There's a lot of negotiation that goes on and trying to figure out who you're going to help or who you're going to hurt and risking your own ships really plays a big part in the game. So I picked out three games that utilize that mechanic in a fun and interesting way. So if you like that, definitely try these games out. So first up, Shadow Hunters. Now, Shadow Hunters is very much a hidden role type of game where you have the shadows and you have the shadow hunters, so to speak. So it seems like there's just two general sides and no one else really gets involved, although nobody knows who each other is. But there are these neutral characters that you can play in the game. So if you play with the higher player count, the neutral characters come in and the neutral characters have different win conditions. Sometimes they want to die. Sometimes they want to help one side, not the other. Just a bunch of different wacky ways in which they win. So when you're actually playing the game and you're like, is that person on my team? They're kind of helping me. They're kind of hurting me. I'm not really sure where they are. And that neutral faction is just jumping in based upon that particular situation. I'm not a huge fan of, you know, hidden role player games, but a shadow hunters, especially with the neutral characters is one of my favorite games. Next up CO2. Now CO2 is interesting because it is a co-op game in some fashions and there's multiple ways to play CO2 with its recent reprint, but it's also a competitive game. And the idea of the game is you need to win, but at the same time, if the earth dies, everybody loses and, you know, it's kind of what's going on right now. So, you know, CO2 and life in general is all about helping each other out because if we lose, we all lose together. And it's good to build those partnerships up, especially when it helps everyone involved. And finally, probably the, you know, the king of these kind of temporary partnership games and then a knife in your back five minutes later is game of thrones the board game we recently talked about this game and its recent expansion and basically the mechanic is very very similar to cosmic encounter so someone is setting up for a battle and you also have your own actions and one of the actions you can choose whenever actions are chose is you could support another family in a battle 
Uh, they may or may not know that. You may negotiate that with them. You may trick them and not support them. You may decide to attack them. So you'll place your token down, you'll flip it over, and now you're supporting another family in their battle against some other family. That's great until you decide not to do that again or to kind of backstab them. So those tokens and how you play your family's resources to help or deny people victories or, of course, to attack them at the same time is really what Cosmic Encounter comes down to. Fantastic. Take that gameplay with really interesting and unique partnerships that, you know, from time to time come together and other times fall apart. So that's everything for them. If you like Cosmic Encounter, try out these other games. All right, so until next time, this is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com.